well, good evening. If uh, you have your Bibles with you, uh, open them to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We're starting a study in the book of Galatians tonight. And the backdrop to the book of Galatians and many of Paul's epistles are found in the book of Acts. And so once you're in Acts, there I am, I can hear me now. Uh, Once you're in Acts, turn to Acts chapter 13, because it's in Acts chapter 13 where the Holy Spirit gives a stunning commission to the church at Antioch, specifically to Barnabas and Paul to take the message of the gospel out from Judea and begin to spread it it to the ends of the earth. And so Acts chapter 13, I want to just read the first three verses in Acts chapter 13, because really it's a defining moment in the life of the church. The reason you're sitting in a church in Eagle Point, Oregon, is because of what happens in Acts chapter 13. And oftentimes when we read this section, we just blow right by it. But it's actually, it's... It's, um, it's right here where the gospel just kind of explodes out and it starts to spread all over the world. So look at Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch. Now this is Syrian Antioch, uh, just north of Judea. In this church, it was a church that was found, uh, started by, well, actually, it was started by some unnamed heroes of the faith who took a chance in this predominantly Gentile territory and they started telling the gospel to uh, people other than Jews. And all of a sudden, this little church was birthed and Barnabas, the apostles in Jerusalem, sent Barnabas up there to check it out because they couldn't believe all these Gentiles were being saved. So they sent Barnabas up there. Barnabas started teaching and he said he realized his gift was an encouragement and so he went and found Saul of Tarsus. Saul, Paul, brought him down to Antioch And they began teaching together, kind of co-pastoring for a year together in Antioch. And anyways, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas, and notice the order here, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Holy Spirit calls this church, commissions this church to to lay aside, let go of their top two leaders, Barnabas and Saul, and let them go. This is a growing, thriving church. If you were a part of the leadership team of a growing, thriving church, would you really want to let go of your top two leaders? This would be like a a kind of a a shock. And so you'll notice, verse 3, then after fasting and praying, they went right back to fasting and praying. Why? Well, they wanted to make sure they really heard from the Holy Spirit. And this wasn't just holy goosebumps. Uh, They really wanted to make sure they heard directly from the Holy Spirit. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So this young church takes this incredible step of faith of releasing Barnabas and Paul and they head off on what we now know as the first missionary journey. In chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts, it covers this uh, missionary journey and most of it is done in the region now known as Turkey. Can, Sharon, can you put that map up on the wall? Uh, do you guys see the, see the map? So they start in Syria and up there in Antioch, and they, they head from Syria to Cyprus, and then from Cyprus they, they go to uh, Perga in Pamphylia, and from Perga they go into the region known as South Galatia. And this is uh, churches, can you guys see that? If, if you need to, you can squint really hard. I just had my eyes examined the other day, at the end of the year. My, my prescriptions have changed, and so I noticed... I'm squinting a lot now. Um, If you need to squint, they go first up into Antioch in Pisidian. Now, this is different Antioch than Antioch of Syria. This is uh, Antioch in Pisidia. This is southern Galatia. And then they go to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Now, these are the the, uh, churches in southern uh, Galatia. And it's there 
that Paul kind of takes the lead in the missionary endeavor. And you can see it, actually. Look at verse 13 in chapter 13. Notice how Luke words it. He says, now Paul and his companions. So it switches from, Paul and, or from Barnabas and Saul. Now Luke says, now it's Paul and his companions. So Paul takes the lead in this missionary endeavor. And we don't have time to look at all of this, but Paul's ministry in South Galatia, suffice it to say, it was nothing short of amazing. And the ministry in South Galatia, it was centered on the proclamation of God's grace in and through Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse 15 in chapter 13. They get into Antioch. <clears throat> they go to the Sabbath uh, synagogue service. Look at verse 15. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, Paul and Barnabas, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up. So Paul stands, and what he does, is, and we're not going to read it all, but Paul retraces Israel's history, and he shows how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And he was their long-awaited Messiah, their saving king, but the people of Israel didn't recognize him, and because they didn't recognize him, they rejected him, and because they rejected him, they crucified him, and they killed him, but God vindicated his claim to be the Messiah by raising him from the dead. This is all that what Paul is saying. So skip down to verse 38 in chapter 13. Paul gets to the end of the message and he says, let it be known to you, therefore brothers, that through this man, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed. Freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Well, what couldn't you be freed from by the law of Moses? Sin. You couldn't be freed by, from sin. And Paul's saying, by this man, you can be freed from all of your sin. Look at verse um, 40. Beware, therefore, Lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I'm doing a new, for I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And as they went out, out of the synagogue, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after, um, and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews... And devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace. In the grace, not in the law of Moses. Continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, so a week goes by, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now, there's some hyperbole there, no doubt. But what he's saying is, there's a great many people in this city, in Antioch, who came back to hear this message about one who would free them from the law, who would free them from sin by freeing them from the law. This is what's taking place. In each city, the ministry centered on the proclamation of God's grace in and through Jesus Christ, that you can be saved apart from works of the law, that all you needed to do was put simple but genuine faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and you'll receive God's grace. In each city, in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, and in Derbe, Paul proclaimed this stunning message, how God's grace is available to anyone, Jew or Gentile, man or woman, simply through faith in Jesus Christ. So the ministry is centered on the proclamation of God's grace. And the people responded to this proclamation in one of two ways. On the one hand, uh, the proclamation provoked great hostility. Those within Judaism, so those Jews who um, believed that you, you could only be saved through keeping the Torah, through keeping the law, you got to keep working and keep working in order to really be saved, those 
who, those who believed that, uh, you had to keep all of the laws, and if you were a Gentile and you wanted to be saved, you wanted to be included in the, the family of God, you had to be circumcised. Those people who believed that, um, it provoked Paul's proclamation that you can be saved by simple grace. Uh, that, it provoked them to great hostility. Look at verse 45 in chapter 13. Look at what happens. But when the Jews saw the crowds... They were filled with jealousy, and they, per, they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Skip over to chapter 14. Uh, skip down to verse 4. Now, this is taking place now in Iconium. Chapter 14, verse 4, in Iconium. But the people of the city, after Paul had preached, were divided. Some sided with the Jews, and some sided with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. So they move on to Lystra to preach the gospel there. Uh, skip down to verse 19 in chapter 14. Now they're in Lystra. Verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, so they're just kind of following Paul. They're one step behind um, Paul. You know the new Aladdin movie where he's singing one step ahead of the bread line? One, okay, all the guys that were chasing, you guys know the new Aladdin movie, right? If you haven't seen the new one, it's fantastic. You should watch it. Will Smith does a great job. Nobody thought that he could replace Robin Williams. But he actually did. He nailed the part. Uh, anyways, that song where the, everybody's chasing him, um, that's what's happening here. Paul, is one, Paul and Barnabas are one step ahead of these guys. They moved from Antioch to Iconium to Lystra. And each place that he would go, they would hear, oh, well, Paul's in that city now. And so they would, they would just follow Paul right behind him. And look at what happens. Verse 19. Um, but the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds... They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So they stoned him, and they thought, well, he's dead, so we're going to pull him out of the city. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, and he entered the city. Uh, and you would think, you know, if you're Paul at this point, you would think, I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm taking a break. <laughs> I've had enough of this nonsense. But look at this. On the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby, And they went in, verse 21, they had preached the gospel. <laughs> this is shocking. When they had preached the gospel of that city and had made many disciples. So Paul, he just brushes himself off. He goes into Derby the next day, preaching the gospel the next day in Derby. Now ask yourself, what caused this hostility? Why were these people so provoked that it caused such a reaction that they responded with this amount of hostility? What was it? What caused this hostility? Here's what it was. It was Paul's insistence. Paul's insistence that a person be, can be saved and made right with God apart from works of the law. Paul came on the scene and he started saying that Jesus, he kept the entire law. Jesus kept the entire law. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And when you trust him, his record of righteousness is theological terms. It's imputed to you. It's credited to your account. That's what imputed means. It gets accredited to your account. So Paul came, in, came on the scene and said, this law that we've been trying to fulfill that we've never been able to, Jesus came as the perfect Israel. He fulfilled it and when you trust him, he gives it to you through simple faith in Christ, through his grace. This, this right here, this blew their minds. This is absolutely stunning news. He's saying, and when he gives you his record of righteousness, you can simply rest in that. There's nothing you need to do to try to earn it. Righteousness then, think about this, righteousness isn't something you achieve. This is what Paul's saying. Righteousness isn't something you achieve. It's something you receive. Now look, that's a completely different category. It's not something you achieve through your works, it's something you receive 
through Christ as a gift. This is what Paul's saying. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you simply receive it. And Paul's insistence upon this, that a Gentile and a Jew, a Jew and a Gentile, could be saved apart from taking part in Judaism, it completely, it provokes so many within Judaism to hostility. Now, that's one response. On the other hand, the proclamation, it produced also new life in Christ. And what it did is it birthed all these new Christian communities in southern Galatia. Look at chapter 13 again. Back up. Look at chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, that, that anybody can be saved apart from works and apart from circumcision, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. You better believe they did. When Paul said, you can, be, you can be saved apart from works and apart from being circumcised, the Gentile men were, they were dancing. And they were glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to, uh, and, uh, and as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. I love that line. Have you ever thought about this lately? That the Lord uses human beings and human words to impart eternal life. Let that just sink in in your brain. That the, the Lord, the God of the universe, he chooses to work through human beings and human words, communicated words, to impart eternal life. That is just shocking. And this is what's taking place in every city that Paul proclaimed the gospel in southern Galatia. Yes, there was op opposition, and yes, there was rejection, and there will be for you as well when you communicate the gospel to other people. But the Lord uses Paul's simple words. Paul was not eloquent. He says it himself. Paul, the Lord uses Paul's simple words to draw people into eternal life. That is amazing. Skip over to chapter 14. Look down at verse 21. We looked at it earlier, but look at it again, what Luke says. When they had preached the gospel, and, and preached there, it, it um, simply means to communicate. It doesn't mean at a pulpit. It just means when they had communicated the gospel, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and then to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening, so they retraced their steps, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. So they kind of just retraced their steps and they went back and they strengthened the brothers. And Paul knew they needed to be strengthened and they needed to be encouraged because he knew that when he left, they would face hardship and they would face continued opposition. Look at verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them, in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So Paul and Barnabas, after appointing elders in every new Christian community, um, they return back home to their home church in Syrian Antioch. Uh, okay, now you can turn with me to the book of Galatians, because all of this is the backdrop to Paul's letter to the Galatian Churches. And Sharon, you can pull that map down. So go ahead and turn to the book of Galatians. And what we're going to do tonight, uh, as we do anytime we start a new study in a book, um, we're going to do a flyover of the book. We'll kind of see the landscape, and we're going to see where we're going to be going in the upcoming week. So by way of introduction, let me give you a little bit of a background about the book itself. And if you're a note taker, you'll want to take note uh, on this section. So first thing to note about this book is it's Paul's earliest letter. Galatians is Paul's earliest letter. And I'm of the opinion, and I'm not, not the only one, there's a large group, who think that the book of Galatians is written before Acts chapter 15, um, before the Jerusalem Council, which means that the book of Galatians is probably written around 48 uh, A.D., so just, you, you want to talk about early writings? Uh, this is it. This is Paul's earliest writing, just 15 years 
after Jesus' resurrection, this book is being circulated. Uh, so it, so when, when people tell you that uh, the resurrection and the crucifixion and people calling Jesus the Christ is, came much later, you could say, no, 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 that's not true. The uh, book of Galatians was written, was circulating 15 years, just 15 years after Jesus' resurrection. Um, and probably what happened is after Paul and Barnabas returned from uh, Syrian Antioch, from a, uh, returned to Syrian Antioch after establishing these churches, he hears, probably what happens is he hears the report that after he left, some of these, these Jews came into these, these um, Judaizers, people who said you had to believe in the law, you had to practice the law, who were part of Judaism. They, they came into these young churches, and what they started doing is they started discrediting the message, the message of the gospel, by discrediting Paul. And so what they were doing is they were undermining these young Christians' faith in Christ by saying it's fine that you believe in Jesus, but you still need to keep the Mosaic law, and you still need to be circumcised. Faith is good. Faith in Jesus is good, but it's just not enough. It wasn't sufficient. Your faith is not sufficient for salvation. You need to be circumcised, and you need to keep, um, you, you need to keep the law. You've got to offer a sacrifice in a temple, and you've got to keep the dietary laws. You've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to keep the ceremonial law. And so Paul hears that just like when he was in Galatia and people were following him from town to town, discrediting him, when he's left, these people are still coming into these com Christian communities, these young Christian communities with young Christians, and they're undermining it. And so he hears that the faith of these young Christians is being undermined. They're being told they need to achieve salvation rather than simply receive it in Christ. And so Paul, he writes Galatians, and then he and Barnabas, he writes it, and then they head off to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council to get some answers to the questions about how is a person made right with God. So this is Paul's earliest letter. Second thing to note about the letter is it's Paul's angriest letter. It's by far his angriest letter. On Sundays here, we've just finished Philippians. And Philippians is Paul's most joyful letter on every, almost every sentence in the book of Philippians, you can feel Paul's joy. Uh, and that's quite the opposite when you get into Galatians. From the opening line, you get a sense of Paul's anger. And it leads you to ask, well, what's he angry about? Here's what he's angry about. He's angry that the message of the gospel is being distorted. That's what he's angry about. The message of the gospel is being distorted. And instead of Christians living out their freedom, of, freedom in Christ, they're being led right back into legalism. And legalism is a term that you need to, um, it's a term you need to be aware of, especially as we're in the book of Galatians. Legalism is the idea that in order to earn, it, it, it's the idea that in order to earn or maintain your relationship with Christ, you need to add to grace religious discipline and religious effort. And at that moment, you're no longer relying upon grace in Christ through faith, but you're relying upon your effort and your religious observance. That's the idea of legalism. And you think, well, you may be thinking, well, isn't that just simply a theological matter? No, 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 no. It's a very practical matter. It's a very practical matter. And, and the reality is, Legalism, it's the default setting of the human heart. It, for all of us, we all want to uh, earn our way to something. It's the default setting of the human heart. And our heart says, I got to add something to this. There, it comes out in the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We all say that, right? I say it to my girls all the time. <laughs> hey, honey, sorry, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's, that's the way we're... we're that's the, kind of the way we're wired. It's so hard to simply say, no, I'm saved by the sheer grace of God. We automatically, well, I've got to contribute something. I need to hold up my end of the agreement. And the moment you do that, you're no longer relying upon grace, but you're relying upon self-sufficiency. And I'll tell you, as a pastor, there's a great many Christians who are, who are not simply relying upon grace in Christ. 
they continually think they got to add something to it to hold up their end of the bargain. And you got to ask yourself, what must it be like in the daily experience of a man or woman who really does believe that God's acceptance of them is based upon their performance for him, their performance for God? Have you ever attempted to live that way? Are you attempting to live that way now? Because the moment that you do that, you've left the gospel behind. You've absolutely left the gospel behind. And you will not have joy. You won't have peace. You won't have freedom. And you won't have lasting love. Well, what will you have instead? Well, you'll have insecurity. You'll have doubt. You'll have guilt. You'll have fear. And you'll have despair. Because it's no longer about God's grace given to you in Christ. It's about your ability to perform for God. And no matter how great your efforts may be, you'll realize that you've fallen short of God's righteous standards. And therefore, you'll live in despair and you'll always be striving. In your heart and emotionally, you'll always be striving to earn God's favor. And this is what's happening in South Galatia. These people are coming in and saying, no, 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 you can't simply rest in God's grace. That's foolishness. You need to add to it. This, this, the legalists were coming in and distorting the gospel. And by doing so, they were disrupting, they were, they were knocking off the, um, these young Christians off of the firm foundation of grace. They were disrupting these young believers' faith in Christ. And Paul, who he was angry about it. Look at chapter 1 in Galatians, verse 6. Galatians 1, verse 6. Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, one of Paul or Barnabas or one of his, one of his ambassadors, even, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you've received, let him be accursed. That's, that's the Greek word anathema. Let them be cursed by God. If anyone comes to you and preaches a false gospel that tells you you can't simply rely upon faith in Christ, you need to go back to the law. Let that person be cursed. Look at chapter 2, verse uh, 4. Uh, Paul's talking about um, an occasion earlier in his life, but it, it c catches the same thing. He says, he says, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ, so that we might be, uh, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul says these guys are false brothers who are trying to lead a person back into slavery, back under the law. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, <laughs> he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Were you born again? Were you saved by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, did you achieve your salvation by keeping the law? Or did you receive your salvation by trusting the promise and receiving the Spirit? And if your relationship with the Lord was received through the work of the Spirit, why are you trying to perfect it? Why are you trying to maintain your relationship with the Lord through works of the law instead of simply walking in the Spirit? Who's, who's cast their spell over you? This is, this is crazy making. You've begun by the Spirit. Now continue to walk in Him. This is what Paul's saying. Look at chapter 4, 
Skip down to verse 20. He says, um, he says I, I wish I could be present with you now. I wish I could be face to face. And I wish I could change my tone. <laughs> For I'm perplexed about you. Skip down to chapter 5, verse 12. This is the best of Paul's lines. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. This is how serious Paul is. He's saying, those people who are troubling you, who are saying you need to keep the law, and you need to be circumcised, you need to mutilate yourself by circumcision, I wish they'd just go ahead and castrate themselves. This is how angry Paul's saying. He is hot. Did you know Paul talked this way? This would not fly in a church service. Um, you wouldn't, if you heard your preacher saying something like that, I wish that guy would just go ahead and cut it off. Um, you might be a little bit upset with it. You'd probably send him a nasty email. Um, that's what Paul's saying there. He's, this is Paul's angriest letter. Because, well, we'll talk about this more next week. But gospel revision, which is what these guys were doing, gospel revision is essentially gospel reversal. Gospel revision is gospel reversion, reversion. And what was once considered good news is now bad news because it's now up to you to earn or maintain your righteousness before God. So this is Paul's earliest letter. It's Paul's angriest letter. And then lastly, note, this is uh, the, the book of Galatians is Paul's manifesto. Uh, it's Paul's manifesto. You know what a manifesto is? It's a written statement. That's all it is. It's a written statement declaring publicly the views of its issuer. And this is what Galatians is. If Romans is Paul's magnum opus, and it is, then Galatians is Paul's manifesto. Um, yeah. it, essentially, what you could do is you could take the book of Roman, Romans, and you, if you distilled it down into its essence, what you would get is the book of Galatians. And it's Paul's manifesto because no other book grabs legalism so firmly by the throat. Some have described its contents as the battle cry of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, he considered the Galatians to be the best of all the books in the Bible. He wrote, he said, the epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. To it I am, as it were, in wedlock. So this is Paul's manifesto about the gospel of Christ and the freedom and the peace that it brings. Well, what's it all about? What's the, the book of Galatians all about? Let me give you four words, okay? We've got 30 minutes left. Let me give you four words. And if you remember these four words, you'll have a pretty good grasp on Paul's letter to the Galatians. Here's the first word. Take note. The first word is the word faith. Uh, the word faith, meaning... Christ's grace given to you by faith is completely, is completely sufficient for salvation and life with God. God's grace, Christ's grace given to you by faith is completely sufficient for salvation and life with God. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 beginning in verse 15. Look at what Paul says. Paul's writing to, to the church in Galatia, these churches, he says, some, some of the in, in the church are made up of, of Jewish people. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we, also, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, you see the term justified? I'm, I probably should explain. Uh, this is another term you need, need to be aware of. Uh, justification, it's a legal term meaning how a person is made right with God. To be justified means um, to be declared for, same time, 
declared forgiven of your sins and declared righteous. You've, made, you've been forgiven of your sins and declared righteous. And look at what Paul's saying. He's saying that he and his fellow Jews, they know that a person isn't made righteous through law-keeping. They said this, we know that we're not going to be justified by law-keeping because we've tried it. We've tried to keep all of the law, and we've tried to live up to all of its demands, and we never could. So he goes on, look again at verse 16. He says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith, there's the word, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified, forgiven of our sins and declared righteous by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one, catch that, no one will be justified. So Paul says a person is justified, forgiven of sins, declared righteous. They've been, another way you could say it, we don't say it in English in, in America, a, a person's been righteousized. That's one way to look at it. They've been made righteous, righteousized, by nothing else other than simple but genuine faith in Christ. There's nothing else that needs to be added to it. No works to be done, no code to be kept. You put simple but genuine faith in Christ and you're forgiven of all of your sins and declared righteous at the same time. That's amazing. That is just a stunning declaration. Skip down, though, to chapter 3. Look at verse 11. Look at what Paul's saying. Because he, remember, he's writing to some within the churches in Galatia who have Jewish background. And so he says, verse 11 in chapter 3, Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law. And they would say, well, well, what do you mean? And what do you mean? Why is that evident? Well, look at what they say. He quotes Habakkuk 2, Old Testament. The, the Old Testament, he says, look at Habakkuk 2. The righteous shall live by faith. So Paul says, even in the Old Testament, it teaches that righteousness can't be achieved through keeping the law. It must be received through faith. It must be received through faith. Now, Christian friend, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the sense of assurance that this brings in your relationship with God. If you didn't earn God's grace, which you didn't, if you didn't earn God's grace but you simply received it through faith in Christ, if you turn that coin over, what it means is if, if there's nothing you did to earn it, what it means is there's nothing you can do to lose it. If Christ saw you at your worst and he still chose to bestow his grace upon you, then there's nothing you can do to lo lose it. Praise now, wow. yeah, 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 praise God. Now contrast that with every other major world religion. Every other religion offers you a reward later. Only in Christianity, only Christianity gives you absolute assurance of your status now because it has nothing to do with your works. Um... In October, I was in, and in Hinduism, when you die, your family has to make sacrifices every day for 10 years to increase your chances of reincarnation, of being reincarnated into a better life form, essentially. Um, you're never really sure where, you're not sure at all. You have no security that you're going to be reincarnated into something better if you're ever going to reach uh, the highest uh, state, none of those things. Christianity, now look, contrast that with the gospel. Because of what Christ has done, and he's given you his grace, he's declared you righteous, his righteousness is credited to you because you need more than just a neutral slate in your life. You need more than just a neutral slate before God on judgment day. You need positive righteousness. Because Christ lived the perfect life, and that life, his record of righteousness is given to you, and you're forgiven of your sins, and his positive righteousness is given to you, you're absolutely assured, absolutely assured that your status before God is secured. Christian friend, what it means is you're secure. Am I going too fast? Okay, you are secure in God's grace given to you in and through Jesus Christ. You can rest in his grace. And the life you live now, you live uh, in faith, through faith in Christ and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But you are absolutely secure in his grace. Look at 
Uh, look at chapter 2, verse 20. The life you live now is lived by faith under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, Paul says, um, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. My, my sinful nature has been put to death. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, still in my mortal body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and who gave himself for me. So all of this is brought about by the Lord's love for you and his sacrifice on your behalf. And, and you, by faith, are joined to him and given his record of righteousness, righteousness, which means you're secured in his love forever. So what's the book of Galatians about? It's about faith in Christ. It's about, seriously, it's about faith in Christ. And the moment you put simple faith in Jesus Christ, you receive, not achieve, you receive his life and his grace permanently. Second word to remember is the word family. Second word to remember about the book of Galatians is the word family, meaning the moment you put faith in Christ and you've been declared righteous, at the same time, you've been grafted into God's family. You've been uh, adopted or grafted into God's family. You're no longer a slave. You're a son or a daughter of the king. Look at chapter 3, verse 23. Um, Paul, it, what's happening here in chapter 3? Paul's just said that the law, it is good and it served its purpose. Well, what purpose did it serve? It showed us our sin and it showed us our need for a Savior. And now through faith in Jesus, we've been made sons and daughters of God. Look at verse 23. Now before faith came, that's, that is um, faith in Christ, now, before uh, faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified uh, by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. Skip over to uh, chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4, look at verse, um, verse 4. Look what Paul says. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if, an, and if a son, then an heir through God. So Paul says, through faith, you've been adopted into God's family through Christ. And everything that he's earned is given to you. Everything that he's earned, this is the record of righteousness, everything that he's earned is given to you. Do you guys remember the film, um, the movie Annie? You guys remember the movie Annie? I watched it a while back with my daughters. Annie's a poor, if you remember, the uh, red-headed version of Annie, the older version. Um, well, the plot's the same in both. But Annie's a poor, orphaned girl who's under the guardianship of Miss Hannigan, who's played by the great Carol Burnett in the original one. Uh, she's under the guardianship of Carol Burnett. Miss Hannigan, until what happens? Daddy Warbucks. <laughs> Daddy Warbucks comes along and he adopts her. And the moment he adopts her, all of his wealth, which she didn't earn, but he did, all of his wealth, which he earned, everything that he's earned, all of his status, all of his love has been given to her. And at that moment, if you remember the end of the movie, he gives her a little locket and they sing a little song um, but what's happening is her life has been completely transformed because everything that he's earned, all the status he's achieved, and all of his love is given to her in her life because of it. 
is completely transformed. She's no longer under the guardianship of Miss Hannigan, this crazy, cruel person, but she's given, she's bestowed in this amazing love. And Paul says, this is what's happened to you when you've come to Christ. You've been adopted by God through Christ. And because of it, because you've been adopted by God through Christ, you ha now have, look at this, a new intimacy with, with God. You have a new intimacy with God where once you were his enemy, you're now his son or daughter, which means you're loved personally, profoundly, and uniquely. By faith, you've moved from, from a position of a slave to a son, which means you have, as a, as a child of the king, you have continual access to God the Father. You can go to him in prayer without pretense or fear. You can, you, just as a child does to a, with a good father. So you have a new intimacy, but also notice you have a new family. Uh, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 28, he says, In Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. Now he's not obliterating the distinctions. What he's saying is, here's what he says, For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Meaning, in the body of Christ, the in the new family, the family of God, there's real unity. There's a real connection, meaning that we're joined together as brothers and sisters. And he's talking about the church. He's saying you're joined together in deep and profound ways with one another because God's your father and we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I know when people talk about the church, there's some crazy brothers and sisters in the church. Crazy uncles and aunts within the church. So that you, you, They do some things, they say things, and you kind of... Walk right past them. There's some awkwardness every once in a while. But what he's saying is, the church is your family. Um, the church becomes your real, legitimate family. And we're connected to one another. So we have new intimacy with God. You have a new family, which, honestly, we take for granted a lot of times. Uh, you do not take it for granted in other parts of the world. You, the, the church is your family. They are caring for you, and you are caring for one another. Um, and if you come from like a dysfunctional family, the, the body of Christ, it is your family. It is, the, it's like the best news going, um, that you have a real family that loves you, cares for you, love one another, you care for one another. That's the great, it's a great piece of information. Sometimes we flat just take for granted. So we have a new intimacy with God. You have a new family. And then lastly, notice you have a new destiny. Paul says, because you're sons and daughters, last part of uh, the passage, because, verse 7, he says, because you're sons and daughters, you're an heir, implying an inheritance. And the inheritance is the spirit. Well, what's the spirit do? Well, what has he done? This is the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, which means your destiny is undiluted life pure, undiluted life. That when your body breaks down, your mortal body breaks down here on earth, you will be raised to new life. This is exactly what Paul says elsewhere in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Paul says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit lives in you. Which means your resurrection life is a foregone conclusion because of this new destiny. Because you've been adopted, your destiny is nothing short of eternal life. <laughs> this is amazing. This is amazing. So the book of Galatians, it's about faith in Christ. Second, it's about being brought into God's family. Third, third word for you to remember is the word freedom. The word freedom, meaning you've been, as a Christian, uh, as a new covenant believer, you've been freed from the law. You've been freed from the law, but at the same time, you've been freed to uh, a couple of other things. You've been freed from something, you're freed to something. Look at uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, 
How can you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. These are all parts of the ceremonial law. I'm afraid, Paul's saying, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So these Jewish false brothers were telling these young Christians they had to go back and follow the ceremonial laws of the Mosaic Covenant in order to maintain their righteousness. And Paul's saying, no, you don't. No, you don't. You've already been made righteous in Christ. You simply are free to worship him. Now skip over to chapter 5, verse 1. Look at what Paul says. He says, for freedom, here's our word, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, I Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, if you go back to coming under the law, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. He says, you've been freed from the law. You've been freed from legalism. He says, if you try to keep the law, Christ will be absolutely of no advantage to you. And you'll fall away from his grace. Why? Well, because you won't be relying upon his grace anymore. You'll be of no advantage. You're going to be relying upon your own effort and not upon his grace. Now, if you've been freed from something, what it means at the same time is you're freed to something else. You've been freed to something else. Well, what have you been freed to? Well, namely obedience. You've been freed to obedience. But not to an external law, but to an internal law written on our hearts. And this is the promise of the new covenant. You've been freed, not to, an ex to follow an external law, but to the internal law written on our hearts by the, whole, by the, by the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Jot down uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. Just jot it down when you have time. Look it up. Um, verses 31 through 34. This is, this is the promise of the new covenant, that God's Spirit will write His law on your heart, and he will move you to be obedient. Amen. He'll move you to obedience. You've been freed to worship the Lord as you walk in the Spirit, not because you have to in order to earn righteousness, because by, but because by the Spirit you'll want to as a response to the grace that you've received, which is why Paul in, in chapter 5, verse uh, 16 he says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the, of the flesh. So Christian friend, you've been freed from the law. You've been freed to obedience through the power of the Spirit. And you've also been freed to love and serve one another. Look at chapter 5, verse 13. Hmm. Look what Paul says. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we're freed to love and serve one another in the power of the Spirit, just as Christ loved and served us. Now, when, by the power of the Spirit, we're being obedient to the Lord, we're worshiping the Lord in obedience, and we're loving and serving and meeting the needs of others, what we're actually doing in that moment, by the power of the Spirit, is we're fulfilling the law. We're actually fulfilling the law at that moment. When we're walking in obedience to the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, when you're doing that by the power of, your, by the, power of the Spirit, you are, in that moment, you are fulfilling the the law. So Christian friend, you've been freed from the law and you've been freed to obedience and service, love and service, through the Spirit. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay, last word. It's the word, last word, it's the word formation. Formation, meaning 
Christ's spirit forms our character into his likeness. Christ's spirit, as we cooperate with it, forms our character into his likeness. This is the goal of every Christian. Look at chapter 5, verse, um, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. Look at what Paul says. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Um, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. <coughs> Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Does that not sound just like the world? Uh, I mean, is that not a fitting description? I mean, that is the world that we live in. These are all of these things. This is the flesh. This is the expression, the sinful, uh, the sinful heart being expressed in every, in every which way. Just gratifying the desires of their flesh. He says, I warned you, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this is their continual lifestyle, if there's no repentance and no faith in Christ, and they just continue to act out their sinful flesh, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, keep going, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in your life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now look at the list of the fruit of the Spirit. These are the character traits of Christ. You, look, you, you put those character traits over the life of Christ, and they'll, they'll all just line up with the, the character of Christ. And he's, what he's saying is, as we walk in the Spirit... As we listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, as we move to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, He shapes and transforms our character so that over time, and it's a long process, over time we become more and more like Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, turn over to Titus chapter 3 real quick. We're just about done. Titus is right before the book of Hebrews. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Titus um, chapter 3. Paul says just almost word for word. Look at verse 3 in Ch Titus chapter 3. But I want you to notice the contrast, how the Spirit produces this. Look at what he says. For we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. This is how we all were. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of, a kernel, of eternal life. So all of this, you see, all of this is the work of the Holy Spirit as we cooperate with the Spirit. He transforms our character over time from what we once were to what we hope to become 
in Christ, as we cooperate with the Spirit. Go ahead and turn back to the book of Galatians. As we walk in the Spirit, our character is transformed, and we become more and more like Christ. And again, that is the hope of every Christian, mature Christian. We will become more and more, our character will reflect more and more to a greater degree the character of Christ. That is amazing. Okay, let me wrap this up. You know, the message of Galatians needs to be heard over and over and over again for at least three reasons. The message of of Galatians, first of all, it's life-giving. The message of Galatians is life-giving because the message of Galatians is the message of the gospel. (laughs) That anyone can come to God through Christ in simple faith apart from works and be forgiven of their sins and given new life in Christ. But you have to come to Christ. You have to come to Christ. So it is incredibly uh, exclusive. But it's also widely inclusive. Because anybody can come. Jew or Gentile, male or female. doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter their lineage. It's open to anyone apart from works. This message is that anyone can be saved apart from works and receive new life in Christ. That is amazing. So this message is life-giving. Secondly... It's liberating. Secondly, it's liberating. Because at the heart of it, what Paul's saying is, Christ's grace is so rich and so free, there's nothing you need to do to earn it. There's nothing you need to do. His his grace is so rich and so free, there's nothing you need to do to earn it. You simply need to receive it. Which frees you to simply rest in the Lord's mercy and grace. You know what else it frees you to do? It frees you to share the message. It frees you to share the message with anyone and everyone and tell them that they too can come to faith in Christ apart from works, that they don't need to clean up their life beforehand, that there's no works they need to do, they don't need to get their act together beforehand, they can simply come to faith in Christ and be forgiven of their sins and be given new life. It frees you. What it actually frees you to do is to engage the mission of Christ, to take and share his life and his message and his grace as far and as wide as possible. So this message is life-giving, it's liberating, and then lastly, it brings lasting peace. The message of Galatians brings lasting peace. First, with each other. I mean, not first, but first in our purposes, with each other. Why? Because, Because of the message of Galatians, we know that we're all sinners simply saved by grace. If we're not saved by works, what it means is all of us are on equal footing before the Lord. Galatians, it anchors our fellowship with one another by reminding us that we're all on equal footing before the Lord. So it gives us lasting peace with one another, but then also with the Lord himself. It gives us lasting peace with the Lord himself. We're rescued and we're kept by the, sh- the Lord's sheer personal grace in and through Christ, not by our works. So we can really rest and we can really live at peace with him. There's a story told of uh, Martin Luther who, before the Reformation, before he ignited the Reformation, he was a Catholic monk, Catholic monk and a Catholic priest. And at one time, he went on a pilgrimage to Rome. And there at the uh, Lantern Church, there were 29 steps leading up to the church. And the priest taught that if you go up these stairs, and the, the stairs were called the sacred stairs, But if you could go up these stairs on your knees and on each step recite an Our Father and a Hail Mary, and then you would go on to the next step and you would recite a Hail Mary and an Our Our Father. And if you did that on every step until you reached the top, that you would earn a certain amount of indulgences, which could reduce your time in purgatory. So the story goes that Luther, R.C. Sproul told the story, Luther, uh, he goes... And he sees it, and he climbs each step on his hands and knees, reciting the lines. Reciting on each line, the Our Father and the Hail Mary with the rosary. Each step, just step after step on his knees, on his hands and knees, reciting 29 steps. And he reaches the top. And he looks back over the stairs, and he mumbles these words to himself. Who knows if it's true? Who knows if it's true. He had done all of these steps. He had done all of the things the church 
required monks and priests to do, and he still had no lasting peace, no sense of forgiveness, no sense of assurance. It wasn't until later that Luther came to understand God's grace comes not by works, but through simple faith in Jesus Christ. And when that realization hit, he was finally and fully, finally and fully gave Luther lasting peace. So the message of Galatians, it's life-giving, it's liberating, and it brings lasting peace. And you enter into it by letting your full weight down on Christ. You enter into this life, this liberating life, this lasting peace, this joy, this salvation. You enter into it by letting your full weight down on Christ, receiving his grace through simple faith. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. I'll let you go. Father, we thank you. As we get into this book, we thank you for this book. We thank you for the message of the gospel that on every page it seems like Paul is proclaiming the gospel again and again that it is not through our works, it's not through our efforts, it's not through our obedience, it's through your effort and your obedience and your record of righteousness which is given to us by simple and genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we marvel in your grace. We pray that we would never take your grace for granted, that we would stay in step with the Spirit. You would be leading and prompting us at every turn to become more and more obedient to Christ, the law of Christ, and walk in your ways all the days of our life. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. See you next week.